Hi, good evening. Um, just before we start to uh, night's show, we're going to show a couple of videos of Chris in action. I hope you enjoy them and I will speak to you in about 10 minutes. Our clear takeoff, uh, clear display, winds 34014 knots. gentlemen um hopefully you enjoyed some of those videos some with sound i think and some perhaps uh, without uh one of these days we will get it sussed how to play sound over uh these webinars uh so i apologize for that but uh, hopefully you've got an inkling there of what you're going to uh uh hear chris talk about uh tonight uh chris um has uh loads of experience in civil uh aerobatics display uh, performing um, in high performance aircraft types which you've uh, just seen. Uh, he's flown at many air shows across the whole world and you're going to hear a bit more about his exploits in that. He also as well as operating uh, G-Force Aero 
uh, batics. Um, also, um, uh, holds, um, sorry, runs a company, Flow Solutions, where he's actually an aerodynamicist and hydrodynamicist. And he actually does a lot of work for Formula One uh, teams in developing uh, their cars. So quite an interesting guy. Um, hopefully we're going to have quite an interesting uh, lecture tonight. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to hand over to Chris now. Hey guys, um, good evening everybody. Um, I hope the technology holds together in these times of lockdown and you can uh, see me and see the slides to um, hear a little bit about the um, air show flying, aerobatic display flying this evening. So let's see if we can um, get some slides going. Uh, OK, so uh, just to give you a brief introduction in terms of the uh, display flying that uh, I've been involved in. Um, I'm um, a solo aerobatic display performer and also a member of the Global Stars um, aerobatic team. And this uh, slide just gives an illustration of the hardware that we uh, fly. We have, um, I believe, up to seven aircraft high performance aerobatic monoplanes in um, Global Star's livery. And uh, several of them are uh, the German uh, origin extra um, aircraft. And also in this slide are a couple of French CAP 232 monoplanes. And they're very, very capable aerobatic machines, stress to plus 10, minus 10 G, and uh, stronger perhaps than the, even the pilots who fly them. So we have great faith in their, in their structural integrity. And we're typically flying them to G limits in a, in a display of something like plus nine, minus six G perhaps. So uh, we're um, a bunch of civilian uh, display pilots in the Global Stars team led by Mark Jeffries, who's uh, a multiple UK national aerobatic champion. And um, unlike the Blades, who operate a similar display team, we don't have a military background. We come from a civilian competition aerobatics uh, background. So uh, competing at the various levels of the national championships and rising up to the ultimate level, which is uh, unlimited and competing for the national trophies. So having done that and won various uh, championships, we've tended to, as solo performers, we've tended to come together now as uh, formation uh, team colleagues and uh, perform various displays in the UK and all over the world. So um, over several seasons, I was also a member of the Twister aerobatics team. And this is uh, myself with the team leader, Peter Wells and the two twister aircraft, which are lovely, graceful, lightweight, composite aerobatic machines to fly, retractable undercarriage, uh, relatively low powered, only 100 horsepower or so. So you have to fly them gracefully. That's horses for courses. You can do nice flowing uh, displays with them. And um, here we are parked up with our um, warm up act in the background. So um, I just want to run through a few slides to give you an idea of the type of displays that we've been involved in and um, the, the places that we've been uh, worldwide. And just to put into context, the, the then move on to the logistics of flying these displays uh, around the world. So uh, this is um, in India. Um, this is at um, a city called Ahmedabad and uh, it was one of the first um, displays that the Global Stars did um, in India. And obviously when you go to places like this, unlike in the UK, typically the, the people there just haven't seen anything like it in terms of um, an aerobatic display before. And so you can draw absolutely monumental crowds. So we were displaying to hundreds of thousands of people each day and we were displaying for most of the week there. 
So um, word tended to get around after the first few days and everybody seemed to pile down to the to the riverfront where we were displaying. And um, unfortunately for the city and for the city authorities, these bridges that you can see underneath are the main arteries for a major city of India. And so really we ground the entire city to a halt during our display. But um, so I'm sure there were some cross people, but most of the, the people seem to absolutely love seeing something new. Um, so that was the view from the cockpit as we um, as we blasted over these bridges, which of course should have been sanitised areas and cleared of crowds. But of course, uh, the Indians were just bursting to to get to wherever they had a decent vantage point of the of the, of the display. So um, I just wanted to to show you um, this slide um, because this is in the United Kingdom and it's Bournemouth Air Show, Bournemouth Air Festival. And it just goes to show that it isn't just um, overseas where you can draw enormous crowds to air displays. And according to the um, British Air Display Association, uh, there were almost 5 million spectators watching uh, UK air displays in 2019. Um, and that places it third in the outdoor spectator events behind football and horse racing. So it really, really is a big deal. And I think in the in the heyday of the air shows, going back a few years earlier than that, I think it was it was number two only to uh, football as as the most important spectator event um, in the UK. So um, for the big seaside shows like Bournemouth. Um, it's incredibly uh, important to their tourism and their economy in the summer months and they organise the air shows to last pretty much um, you know an entire week to try to draw people in to uh, stay for the week, spend their money uh, locally, enjoy the air show and um, uh, spread the displays out to weekdays and also to have night air events, which I'll talk about later. So um, it's um, it's a very, very popular uh, spectator activity. So I just want to take you on a on a brief tour of the of the world to some of the destinations that we've been to just for illustration. Um, Clearly, this is this is Gibraltar, the Rock of Gibraltar, where we displayed with the twisters, and um, this is an example of the sort of furthest, typically the furthest point that we would fly the aeroplanes to to do displays. So, anywhere in Europe, um, displaying in Eastern Europe <coughs> or Southern Europe and places like Gibraltar, we would fly fly down. Um, and for the Gibraltar show, it took a couple of days to to, to get there, an, an overnight stop, and then and then arrive and display. So that's uh, that's all great. Um, it's a bit more of a challenge when you go to the other extreme and go to places like China, where it's just um, unfeasible from every possible aspect to to, to actually fly that fly the planes there. So um, I'll talk uh, shortly about uh, what we do in those situations in terms of getting the aeroplanes there. So this was for a display just just for, for your amusement. This was actually launching um, a new Skoda car onto the Chinese market and there were press and VIP. Uh, another venue that uh, was uh, really entertaining just by way of example. This was um, racing the ex Formula One driver Jensen Button um, in Barbados and uh, around the racetrack at Barbados they have a festival of speed event and um, in the lead up to this event we agreed to uh, fly this display and it sound all sounded great and uh, got the appropriate permissions to do it and in the period between us getting permission to do the display and then us actually executing it. 
the racetrack had actually put up um, a couple of dozen of these very tall and very rigid uh, floodlighting poles. So the event turned into a sort of impromptu pylon race slalom through these floodlight poles, which just uh, up the ante a bit more. And uh, believe me, they're rather less forgiving things than the blow up um, air filled pylons that uh, they use in the in the Red Bull and the Reno air races. So we really didn't want to hit them. So uh, a degree of uh, circumspection was uh, called for there, but uh, all went well. This was um, turning now to the Middle East. This is Bahrain and in fact um, this is overhead the Formula One track uh, that you might recognise from the Formula One motor racing coverage because the Bahrain Air Show is a big trade event. It's held uh, every two years. It's of uh, equal significance to Farnborough in the, in the Middle East region and uh, one of the title sponsors of the Bahrain Air Show is DHL. And so for a few years now um, for the Bahrain Air Show, we have been involved um, with both Twisters and then Global Stars in terms of um, performing displays at Bahrain with a tie up with DHL. So uh, this was a picture from one of the earlier Bahrain shows where we were flying in formation with the DHL 757 freighter, which was exciting. And uh, this was from the last show with the Global Stars in formation with uh, the uh, Boeing 767 uh, DHL freighter aircraft with, with the four aircraft. And it's, um, it is a spectacular uh, experience I can I can say being sat um, a few meters off the wingtip of one of these big jets because um, we the, the the DHL pilots were great obviously they are at the real bottom end of their speed range uh, when they're when they're flying so they had um, all the uh, high lift devices deployed but the undercarriage up and various sort of warning valves going off in the cockpit which they had to uh, cancel. Meanwhile we're sort of at the upper end of our speed range uh, to stay with it and have the have the, the sort of power in hand to uh, to cope with formation changes. And of course the the, the really scary aspect here or, or the, the the aspect that you want to be really careful of is the uh, wingtip vortices off the big jet. So you really don't want to fall behind and start lagging in your formation position and get into the territory of the tip vortices because it's a worst case scenario in terms of the strength of these tip vortices for this type of display because the the aircraft is uh, the freighter is uh, sort of right at the bottom end of its speed speed range, very high induced drag, high lift, high induced drag and very strong tip vortices. So there have been a number of accidents um, in the past with things like Learjets being flipped on their uh, flipped on their back and crashing. So uh, something to be treated with 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 extreme caution. But with um, degree of planning, it's um, possible to execute this type of display safely and uh, it's uh, it's something different. So uh, I want to move on to look at um, the air display logistics and how we actually are able to um, support events in India, China, Bahrain um, logistically. And um, for the long haul events, it really does mean that we need to strip the aeroplanes down uh, into a kit of bits and uh, in order to then transport them and fit them inside typically inside a shipping container. So they, they usually travel inside a shipping container, 40 foot container which I'll show you um, shortly and of course SOD's law um, dictates that the uh, width of the uh, tailplane on an extra is just too wide to go in a shipping container. So it means as well as taking the wing off, you need to take the tailplane off as well. But in order to get the tailplane off, you need to take the fin off as well. So essentially you end up um, dismantling quite a lot of aeroplane in order to fit it inside its box. 
So um, you can see the structure and I, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but in this slide you can see that the uh, wing uh, lifts off as a single piece. It's got a full span carbon fibre spar and that's where a lot of the performance of the aircraft comes from because it's an extremely stiff structure and so it can support these full span ailerons uh, because the wing is so stiff that uh, it doesn't flex even with extremely um, large control deflections and control forces and that's why they, the aircraft are able to roll as fast as they are but it means that on a low wing aeroplane like an extra um, you have to you have to lift this single piece wing off um, vertically, you know, in, in one piece and uh, it, 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 it's removed from above. So there are quite a lot of systems on the airplane that you need to remove in order to get a, get the wing off. And so it's a fairly time consuming process, stripping the airplane down, putting it in a container and then reassembling it at the other end. So this is um, a closer view of the structure. I just wanted to show you the structure of these high performance um, aerobatic planes. So with the with the top cover off, which is, is just a fiberglass cover, you can see the structure. So on the left is uh, my aeroplane. It's the single seat um, extra 300S. And the structure is very conventional. It's a steel welded steel tube um, construction space frame. Um, very strong and very repairable, very inspectable, and um, it's uh, uh, traditionally the, the way that most of these um, aircraft have been constructed. Um, on the right is is perhaps the the, the future. Um, this is um, an extreme air, and um, its successor is the the, the game bird, um, and these aircraft have. Um, a carbon fiber monocoque fuselage as well as having a carbon fiber sparred uh, wing. So that's potentially gives some advantages in terms of even further stiffness of the of the fuselage structure. Um, so a very quick look um, just for your interest at the cockpit instrumentation in the extra. Um, very, very simple um, and just designed for um, visual flight, really. If we have to perform longer transits in potentially slightly uh, dicey weather, then we're able to fit um, removable um, and, um, artificial horizons, which um, allow us to just have some cover just in case uh, there's any issue with um, visibility. But um, fundamentally they're, they're, they're visual flying aeroplanes and the instrumentation is really simple. So um, we've got the engine instruments on the right hand side, uh, digital tachometer. Pride of place in the centre is a, is a G meter and uh, the compass area up here very often has um, an aerobatic sequence um, drawing um, in this position so that as a display pilot I can see uh, what's, uh, what uh, figures I have coming up to, to fly. And then we have uh, altimeter, airspeed indicator and fuel gauges and that's it. So very, very simple. So um, the challenge is to get the aeroplane stripped down and into a shipping container and then uh, when we're on site uh, get them uh, unloaded and reassembled and so we have for the purpose of the reassembly we have our Lithuanian engineer with a large hammer and um, we uh, typically have a team of uh, one pilot and one engineer per aeroplane and uh, are able to get the, the aeroplanes reassembled in a sort of long, very long single day of, of work or um, an evening's work and then, a, and, then a, and then a day the next the next day. So we're a sort of polished operation now really and uh, it's it gets quicker as, as we have more tooling available and more shortcuts in terms of um, in terms of streamlining the rebuild. 
And so we also have our um, Scottish engineer on the bagpipes. And uh, when he's playing the bagpipes, he's a less useful addition to the uh, team, but he's the licensed engineer that has come with us on various trips and and been a source of great amusement to uh, a number of the uh, locals where we've where we've traveled. And so this is a uh, this is a typical um, team picture um, where we're um, in in country in this case in China. So we might have, um, as I say, a team from the UK of uh, four pilots, four engineers, and then a local team um, in China who are fixing up the various permissions for the displays and uh, also uh, looking after us generally and being our minders. And um, if any of you have been to China, you'll know that um, having a minder to look after you can be pretty important because you get faced by various curveballs like trying to decipher what on earth the menu might mean when you're when you're given these kind of translations. So it's all quite funny. and. Uh, Part of the enjoyment of these trips is experiencing these new cultures and seeing new places. So uh, this is now just a little bit more detail on the shipping aspects. And uh, this is uh, strapped down inside the container. So we have um, heavy duty uh, uh, straps from um, typically used to ship uh, loads um, on lorries with with heavy duty ratchets and we have the various jigs and frames in place of the the wing spar we have a special uh, jig which allows us to use it as tie down and the the extra is good because it can stay on its wheels and uh, be wheeled into the shipping container and because uh, the various parts are being suspended from the roof it takes out some of the jolts that you'll get uh, in transit, which uh, can be pretty bad if uh, in country the container is then on the back of a lorry. So uh, the, the Twister team also has um, a rather nice sort of custom made um, trolley to ship the aeroplanes on. And uh, it's, it's a very simple um, aeroplane uh, to structurally to to dismantle being fully composite and uh, it can and it's a nice small aeroplane so it can uh, have its wings removed placed upon its trolley and you can be more or less done in an hour or so 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 that's uh, that's uh, quite handy for shipping so once we have our uh, machines safely inside a container the question is how are we actually going to transport them to the show? And there are various methods, but uh, obviously sticking them on a large container ship and uh, sailing them to places like China is going to be the cheapest, but albeit the longest option in terms of the, the, uh, the lead time that you need to allow with losing your airplane and shipping it to the show. So somewhere on that ship could be uh, and uh, sort of four extras in a box alongside the the rubber ducks and the toilet roll and whatever whatever else. So it might take um, a month to um, sail to to China. A little bit less sailing time, but but at least that by the time that you've um, actually docked and cleared customs and things like that. So in broad terms, that might for sake of argument, cost you £5,000 or so to, to, to ship your container to China or, or, or on a ship. Um, if you, um, depending upon where the show is um, in the world, um, you may be able to uh, ship using um, a train because there is a new long distance um, rail uh, network that's available. Um, and uh, this stretches all the way from, in our case, Hamburg in Germany, which is the pickup point usually, all the way deep into China to uh, if, we're, if we're performing a show in China. And that cuts the journey time down to two weeks and might cost maybe twice that, 10,000 £10, pounds, something like that. So when time is tight, um, 
you uh, uh, the, the the rail trip is is a, is a good option. And then of course um, the real lux luxurious way of doing it is to ship the aircraft by air, and this is a triple seven um, from Aerologic that that's um, um, subcontracted to uh, DHL. And uh, there have been a few shows where we've been able to ship the aircraft by air uh, with thanks to DHL, who we've um, had a tie up with at the Bahrain air show. So these are a pair of extras loaded inside the 777 freighter. And on this occasion, we were able to travel with the aeroplanes ourselves on the, the couple of seats up, up front of the freighter in the, in the 777 and arrive the uh, travel overnight and arrive the next day, which was absolutely fantastic. So obviously an expensive option if you're um, paying for it yourself and um, if you have um, sponsorship from DHL or from Red Bull or, or somebody. Uh, it makes it uh, rather nice and an attractive option though. So um, having shown you, been around the world and shown you a few of the display locations, I want to actually talk a little bit more about the environment in which we operate uh, these displays and talk about the air display regulation because um, I want to, to really emphasize that um, you know, I can show you lots of uh, nice, uh, exciting slides, but there is a whole um, regulatory environment behind that and a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, uh, a lot of legislation and a lot of regulation behind that to uh, try, try our best to to make it as safe uh, an enterprise as possible, particularly after the um, tragedy at, at Shoreham. So uh, this this slide is actually showing the the sort of nerve center of the air display. Um, in this case, the hut containing the flying display director and his flying control committee. And uh, it looks like this is at uh, Dunsfold show and Dave Walton is the flying display director and he's the he's the boss and um, he is ultimately responsible to the CAA for the safe conduct of the show. So he's the man that you need to listen to and he will be on the radio to you or a member of the flying control committee if they see anything that looks a bit uh, 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 suspect or, or any infringements from any other aircraft or anything unsafe or any, any uh, issues that they have. And uh, they have the power to um, call a stop and to um, stop your display and get you to land. So just want to talk a little bit about the, the, the display environment. So there's various pieces of uh, legislation surrounding um, air displays in the UK. And um, if any of you are suffering from um, insomnia during lockdown, all these documents are available online on the CAA website and I can pretty much guarantee that this will help you get to sleep. Um, the uh, obviously the the overarching legislative document is the air navigation order itself. Uh, but underneath that um, the CAA is tasked with regulating flying displays in the UK and the key documents are <coughs> traditionally CAP 403 which um, contains is, is the Bible and of, of, of regulation when it comes to running air displays. And now split off from that is this CAP 1724, which is the pilot's version now of CAP 403, which is looking very much into the details of how you uh, regulate um, the uh, displays themselves and the display pilot authorization process. So um, these days um, every air show has a heap of risk assessment to be done uh, before you can actually uh, get anywhere near to getting permission to stage the air show and then after that to, to actually execute it and fly at it. So I'm by no means an expert on these risk, um, uh, risk uh, assessments but um, 
obviously the general idea here is that um, you identify as many all of the risks as you possibly can and then look at how likely they are to happen and how severe they would be if they were to happen and assign a sort of box for them to sit in within your matrix and if it falls in the red area you need to come up with mitigating measures to move it sort of bottom right to get back into the acceptable area. So you have to do this for all the various risks associated with running the display. And just by way of an example, this would be um, a drone um, infringement um, and the potential that um, a UAV or a drone might have in terms of colliding with your display aircraft during display, which would obviously be bad. So it starts off with a, a sort of review or unacceptable rating and then you apply your mitigation measures, which in, in this case is is sort of publicising that drones are prohibited to, to the public, announcing it on the tannoy, having all your security staff looking for them, uh, have everybody on the radio um, if they see a drone uh, flying and then get the flying display director to suspend the, the display if uh, if one is, is flying until it's been uh, grounded. So if you do all of those things, then you bring the risk down to an acceptable level. And so that's just an example. We, we try to apply that to all the various risk factors that you have in uh, what is still intrinsically um, a sort of risky um, activity. So, um, this is a map especially for my uh, Farnborough audience which you might recognise in terms of your local area. Uh, this is um, just an OS map of the Farnborough area and Farnborough airport with the um, display footprints marked on it and one of the really key aspects that um, emerged after the Shoreham Air Show crash is really the control and management of the display footprint in the various locations and the fact that um, clearly it, it presents an unacceptable risk to have a high performance, high energy aircraft performing aerobatics over a congested area. Um, so there are various display sites that have been really significantly affected by that and Farnborough is certainly one of them and so <clears throat> a very very complicated area of display airspace gets constructed uh, for the for the display and uh, you end up with these little pockets of areas where you're able to conduct your display with various restrictions in in the different areas and so here we have the the um, the main uh, runway of, of Farnborough is, is along this this line here and there's a little tiny stub at the end which is almost crowd centre which you need to stay within uh, your display and it would be very very easy to bust that at this end. Likewise there's a really restricted uh, cross box um, extent which uh, makes life quite difficult for your normal display so very often you might need to tailor your display these days quite substantially to the particular site. And so that's um, a view from the cockpit of uh, what it might look like during the, the, the Farnborough display and that's us on the on that very restricted cross box and um, the Global Stars and the Twister team were just about the only aerobatic acts that were able to exploit that very uh, restricted um, sort of lateral extent of, of display um, and stay stay within the boundaries. Um, so it's very tough to to construct the display sometimes. Obviously, um, the other entertainment at uh, Farnborough in particular is the fact that uh, during the Farnborough display, they have um, validation days where you need to perform your display in front of the Flying Control Committee and get it uh, signed off effectively uh, for the, uh, the main uh, trade and public days and um, they have uh, based at Farnborough um, a rapier surface to air missile system 
originating technology um, in, in the form of the, the, the Rapier's uh, radar guidance system where they're able to track the display aircraft to the meter um, during their uh, validation flights and during their, their, their display flights and actually check to see whether you are actually staying within these uh, display footprints on the ground. And um, it's, um, it, it's, it's all really interesting, very interesting uh, feedback. So this is all done uh, essentially in real time. So after you've landed, you can then have your debrief and see whether you've managed to stick to your display lines and whether you've busted any, any areas. And uh, if you have done by even a, a meter or two, they'll certainly tell you. So once you've, once you've been deemed to be compliant and safe, you then get your sign off to uh, perform your displays. This is another example of a very well known air display location. This is Biggin Hill. And you can see that uh, now in the post Shoreham era, it's, it's bristling with um, avoids and restricted areas and you're left with a rather um, relatively thin area A in which you're allowed to perform your aerobatic display. And there's very limited width for turnaround figures um, at the ends. And there's also a, a, a road uh, just at the end of the air show. And so that's uh, got a non aerobatic minimum level restriction on it. So the old days when people like Ray Hanna in the Spitfire MH434 used to descend down below the height of the airfield into the valley and then reappear in a flourish uh, low over that road. They're, they're, those days are long gone, I'm afraid, so um, we won't see that again. Um, and you need to just um, plan your display incredibly carefully because it's very, very hard to uh, take um, a standard display sequence and uh, fly it at these various venues. You really need to be adaptable and well practiced and be able to think out exactly how you're going to execute the manoeuvres and how much space each of the manoeuvres will take so that you can um, stay within these, these areas. So this is what it might look like in terms of the um, display lines um, at a venue. This is um, Shuttleworth Collection Old Warden. And obviously what's um, completely prohibited is flying over the crowd um, or displaying um, within a certain distance of the crowd. So you have a set of display distances um, from the spectators that you need to adhere to. And um, these did get a little bit larger after the Shoreham um, show, but have been have settled down into into a workable set of figures. And uh, at Shuttleworth, they have a special exemption in terms of the slower um, aircraft that are able to perform as long as they are below a certain height, um, they can perform. Uh, flybys uh, closer than the usual minimum um, display distance. Um, but generally the, 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 the normal display distances are 230 metres from the crowd or under special circumstances, which I'll show you for the lighter aircraft, um, 150 metres. Um, the other special feature that I could mention at Old Warden is that there's a massive avoid area for the um, farm and the, the horses that's um, immediately opposite display centre effectively. So it's another place where you really need to be on your game and miss these various places whilst you're performing your display and uh, tailor it appropriately. So this is what it might look like from the cockpit. Um, that is the same sort of looking down at Old Warden, um, the view from the display line. And uh, this is in the in the extra and you can see just in passing that um, I'm wearing um, being held in my seat by a very um, heavy duty harness. It's actually a seven point harness 
So it has uh, five, the, the, the five points plus uh, a backup to two points, sort of a full redundancy. And it's a ratcheting harness, so I can ratchet myself in really, really tightly into the cockpit um, using the same type of ratchet that we use on the truckers um, uh, straps for, for uh, tying loads down. And this is really important because during a display, you absolutely you're you for for tightly controlled aerobatics, you really don't want to be moving at all in the seat. So you need to be strapped in very, very tightly. And you also um, under this negative G here, it might be up to minus five or minus six negative. If the belts were to fail, you would literally be um, expelled from your from your aircraft like a, a sort of bullet from a gun really it would be a kind of explosive um, disappearance through the top of the canopy so the um, harness is absolutely critical um, this is must be a, a, a tumble or, or some figure like that um, a negative flick um, so uh, this is a case of trying to stay on the on the display line away from the crowd and positioning your figures appropriately um, to stay within the regulations, but to still um, to still present your display to best effect to the public. So there are there are a set of um, separation distances um, which um, we have to adhere to, which are different for the different classes of aircraft. And as I say, 230 meters is the normal for us. The the fast jets would be uh, bigger than that, 450 meters. Um, but um, many of us in the in the global stars, we have an exemption to fly to 150 meters distance from the crowd line, from um, kinetic energy considerations. Because uh, although we fly faster than the 150 knot speed, we're actually lighter than uh, the limiting uh, weight for the 150 meter regulation. So we're allowed to fly to and display to 150 meter limit. And of course, the next aspect of all of this is that we have controlled airspace to contend with. And so there's a patchwork of controlled airspace. These are heights in feet that um, apply above the area around uh, Old Warden, Shuttleworth Old Warden. And obviously these heights are high enough for um, aerobatic displays like ours, but um, they would um, they would affect uh, displays like the Red Arrows. And uh, there are other locations like Biggin Hill where the um, London TMA is only just above the uh, height of the of the airfield. It's 1800 feet is about the maximum that you can display to at Biggin Hill. And that's actually uh, rather close to the type of heights that you would want to uh, get to and run in on an aerobatic display. So another part of the aspect of managing the display is, is not busting controlled airspace as well. And obviously in the in the sort of recent um, current um, uh, situation with very busy commercial air traffic and uh, commercial considerations in terms of late arrivals of, of commercial flights. It's just really realistically isn't possible to uh, guarantee or, or generally get clearance into these controlled airspace. So it tends to mean unfortunately that these days that uh, if the red arrows do display at places like Old Warden then they're usually displaying a flat show even on a, a nice blue sky, sky day which is which is a shame. So uh, talking briefly about the um, the regulation that I have to go through in terms of my currency and my competency to fly aerobatic displays. Um, I have to get signed off every year in front of a display examiner to prove my competency and my currency to fly the display in the aircraft that I intend to display in. And um, these uh, display authorizations are issued for the different classes of aircraft and they have different categories of formation skill associated with them as well. So I have clearance to display um, all uh, um, advanced and gyroscopic manoeuvres and down to uh, 100 feet aerobatic uh, minimum. So if you're a new display pilot, um, these days you wouldn't be issued a display authorization to display um, an aerobatic um, aircraft any less than 500 feet 
um, above the ground. And then with experience, you can um, you can uh, come lower. And also on the display authorization, the different categories of formation uh, member, um, so wingman and formation leader and tail chase member and tail chase leader. So all of these things need to be um, viewed and signed off by an authorised um, display examiner who's appointed on behalf of the CAA. And you need to do this every year. So it is um, tightly regulated. So looking um, briefly at a typical um, display routine, uh, we might have uh, this is this is a, a solo aerobatic routine that's drawn up in a resty notation. So that's the notation that's used in competition aerobatics, and we embellish that a little bit for the use of uh, some of these freestyle figures. Um, so we don't really have time to go through it in detail, but we've got um, erect flat spins and um, inverted flat spins, tumbles, knife edge spins, uh, more tumbles here, a torque rolls here. So there are various um, and inside outside maneuvers. So this is a negative G loop. So there are various sort of uh, quite complicated um, figures that um, are drawn out. So we're not typically we're, we're not sort of winging it in terms of constructing these these displays. We're carefully constructing them from energy and height considerations, putting it together, going away, practicing it. And uh, obviously we have a lot of figures in our repertoire which we can potentially drop in and substitute to suit the conditions and in particular the cloud base, which is always a real nightmare. Uh, but generally speaking, these, these displays are fairly fixed and uh, well practiced and we have sort of rehearsed the various flow from one figure to the next. Um, this is just um, a small piece of schoolboy maths just to make the point about what we're up against uh, when we're flying these displays. Uh, wind and wind correction is a major issue in these displays. So if we look here, you just have to remember that um, if the wind is blowing at 15 knots, which is not particularly strong at height and is quite typical, and if your particular manoeuvre like a flat spin or something is uh, an upline into a downline is taking perhaps 30 seconds to execute, then the wind will, if you do nothing about it, the wind will blow you 230 metres sideways. And obviously if it's an on crowd wind, that's more than the distance that you have between your display line and the crowd. So if you don't take careful measures, you will end up over the crowd and you will bust your display line. So it's a constant kind of game of aerial chess, really, where you need to um, compensate and account for the wind. And there are various techniques for doing that aerobatically where you can slide sideways in loops and make small corrections. And um, in display use, you can um, head off, you know, go off heading slightly to try and um, predict this. But as soon as you go into a vertical maneuver where you really don't have any choice but to be vertical. You are going to be blown, so you need to um, plan ahead for that and uh, compensate. Then, of course, there's um, aspects of weather, weather and weather minima, and uh, we have a uh, uh, constant battle, particularly in England, over cloud base, and you're sort of sat at the end of the runway before a display, wondering and worrying just how high the cloud is. And uh, which of your figures you might need to bin and which of which of them you can keep and how you can uh, adjust your display. So you might have perhaps three different displays on the stocks, um, a flat show, a mid show and a, and a full show um, for to suit the different cloud bases. <clears throat> and if you're flying um, a sort of solo aerobatic display like us, uh, you probably have a bit more flexibility to um, chop and change and substitute and, and change figures and it gets <clears throat> gets increasingly difficult as you have uh, bigger formation displays you really need to um, you really need to uh, stick to the brief and uh, choose your flat show and stick with it so you have mandatory brief briefings before the display which is very important 
and uh, you have uh, we have uh, in the global stars we have our standard operating procedures <clears throat> and we have a whole list of checklist items that we need to talk about before the show what we're going to do in, in in the case of emergencies uh, what the plan is in terms of taxiing, startup taxi takeoff, and how we're going to recover the aircraft and in which order, and make sure everybody knows exactly what they're doing in advance. And what's always very important is to walk through the display several times on the ground before you ever get into the air and fly it for real. So this is uh, Tom Cassells, our team leader in the Global Stars, walking us through the display routine. Uh, on the ground to uh, make sure everybody knows their positions. <clears throat> so we've got Tom and Mark Jeffries, myself and Steve Carver there walking through our display sequence in uh, in India. And um, you do that and it's a really good way of sort of making sure that everybody knows exactly which way they're turning, what you can rehearse um, emergencies as well, what happens if uh, somebody has an engine failure or a radio failure, things like this. And it's a really, really useful exercise to do a lot before you ever get into the aeroplane. So um, just want to say something briefly about um, a different display, um, which is quite unique, which uh, we do, and that's um, flying with a radio controlled scale model. So this is a display that we, we've um, pioneered and um, I fly um, a synchronized display with um, a 40% scale radio control model of the extra that's flown by Mike Williams, who's um, a champion uh, radio control model pilot. And um, we're able to do some nice stuff where we're flying synchronized aerobatics and then the model can, which has incredible thrust to weight ratio and, and it has superb performance that can do sort of crop hangs and it's possible to um, hang on the prop um, on sort of third or half throttle. Uh, it has so much uh, uh, performance and so little weight. So he can go into a prop hang and I can um, do a knife edge pass behind. And we do various formation flybys, which uh, look, look, look quite nice. So um, the way that we make that work is that the model is able to fly a closer display line than the full size aircraft and uh, from the scaling effect of the model relative to the full size um, if he flies closer and i fly further away we can sort of in some senses sometimes um, effectively match the scale that the spectators are seeing from uh, one to the other and it looks like sometimes it's quite hard to tell which is the model and which is the full size aircraft we've we've, we've had those comments I taxied in to refuel at um, Biggin Hill once after this display and uh, the fueler said, oh, you know, does the other one need fuel? And he'd, uh, he'd watched the whole display and actually thought that it was two full size aeroplanes, so uh, uh, which is uh, quite funny. So um, this is a this is a display that would suit the the model very well. Um, where there's a, a grass runway that's closer to the display line than the tarmac runway. And so here the model uh, launched from the grass runway and flew a display using the grass runway as his display axis. And uh, I launched from the tarmac runway and then used the main uh, display axis. So flew sort of further away from the crowd and higher. So the crowd is looking through the model onto the display, onto the full scale plane. And I'm also in a kind of perpetual overtake, so um, it's quite a, it's it's a, it's it's a safe display because we maintain separation in all three axes, really. Um, but this this slide is a bit poignant because this is Shoreham, and um, the uh, A road is is just off the the the, the end of the runway and. Uh, I guess it, it's not possible to perform these displays at this, this venue anymore. So that's what it can look like when you get it right. And uh, this is what um, air displays looked like in the year 2020. Um, this was, we, we performed this um, uh, display with the, with the model at um, a drive-in air show at uh, Old Warden 
which was very successful. The, the, the drive-in air show was very well received by everybody, mainly I think because uh, everybody was absolutely desperate by this point in the summer to be able to get out and uh, get to some event, some flying event or other. And so you can see that uh, they had uh, rather nicely marked out in the grass a set of sort of boxes which um, each uh, car and each family could occupy. And so social distancing was maintained. You could get out of your car, sit in your uh, picnic chair, watch the display. You couldn't um, you couldn't go up to the crowd line. So some of the crowd were a bit further away than than usual. But um, everyone was very positive about it. And I strongly suspect that um, the way things are in 2021, that we'll probably be doing a little bit more of this, um, at least in the first half of the season. So finally, just want to say uh, a little bit about um, pyrotechnic displays as well. Uh, this is another area that uh, uh, we have um, innovated with a couple of other teams in the last few years, which has been very successful for these twilight um, air displays. So this is um, this is a sort of installation on the end of Guy Westgate's um, Aerosparks uh, motor glider with various pyrotechnics uh, strapped onto the wingtips and um, electric firing lines from the cockpit. So various uh, capability of firing off uh, Roman candles, waterfalls, this type of thing, um, which creates really spectacular effects if the uh, if the conditions are sufficiently dark. So we, I performed these displays for several years with the Twister team and uh, we would tend to display at twilight and the first bit of the display would be uh, without pyrotechnics and we'd be performing the usual aerobatic display. And then we'd run in, pull up, light the pyrotechnics and there'd be big gasps from the crowd as, uh, as the sort of full uh, pyrotechnic effect um, kicked in and we had embellishments inside the Roman candles which created these sort of golden balls. So that was, um, you know, always a spectacular experience. And um, <clears throat> I can assure you it was always ex uh, spectacular from the cockpit when you uh, fired them off. You got a sudden burst of light. And uh, if you were flying in the number two position, the key thing was to look at lead and trust in lead. And the key thing from his point of view was to just look straight ahead and try not to get blinded by the, the sort of arc welding going on at his wingtip. So sometimes uh, on a really dark night and in bad weather, it's very, very hard indeed to know which way up you are as, uh, as the number two pilot. You just have to trust in lead. So there are a couple of aeroplanes in here somewhere, a couple of twisters uh, upside down. Um, this was in uh, the north of Sweden and uh, yeah, you can get uh, some really beautiful effects. And uh, this is something that um, the Global Stars have innovated. Uh, Global Stars are the only fully aerobatic um, pyrotechnic team um, using four aeroplanes or more. And one of our party pieces that's uh, unique is this um, pyro pylon run where we uh, are able to slalom the aircraft in between these uh, Roman candles that are being let off to uh, a big height and uh, you can sort of do this um, slalom zigzag through them and uh, in Bahrain last time we did this we had four aircraft and we were all kind of in succession going through the um, slalom run and then getting to the end, pulling up, doing a half Cuban and coming back down through the other way. And uh, it was very, very spectacular. And I think this is the uh, final slide to end on. Um, so a nice pyrotechnic heart. And um, this was, they say, don't they, um, that uh, everyone has their 15 minutes of fame. Well, um, for aerobatic, for, for display performers, your your 15 minutes of fame is, is usually very anonymous and that's probably the best way to be honest because um, the only time it becomes not anonymous is when something goes badly wrong. So I'm, I'm very happy with anonymity. But um, this is a screenshot from uh, Chinese television and it, it, right, it 
sort of makes the point of how amazingly uh, widely seen some of these shows are because this was their New Year Gala uh, Spring Festival for the Chinese New Year and uh, we were performing a display that was just um, uh, you know a small part of their big um, television spectacular and it was connected with um, opening the opening ceremonies for their new bridge that's 50 kilometers long and runs between Hong Kong and Macau and um, they're obviously justifiably proud about this and uh, we laid on a, a pyrotechnic show that was televised on their Chinese New Year and uh, looking on Wikipedia I gather that uh, this Chinese uh, television spectacular was the most watched television program in history. It had uh, 1.3 billion viewers. Um, so <laughs> you certainly do get seen and um, it was um, a really memorable event and uh, I do feel quite privileged to have been involved in these various shows over the years. So that's it. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Hope hope the technology worked, hope you were able to follow that and see all these slides and uh, do please follow us on social media, look at um, air displays, look at the Global Stars team and uh, get in touch. Um, I think you're able to ask any questions uh, shortly so feel free to do that and uh, if you have any ideas for any events that you'd like uh, displays at um, we'd be more than happy to talk about that too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for that. Um, we're now open for uh, questions and our, uh, questions. So if you'd like to uh, type in your questions, I'll ask them of uh, Chris. Uh, a question on um, shipping the aircraft. So how easy is it to re-rig the aircraft and does it always work when you put it back together again? Well, um, certainly speaking personally, um, I'm a lot better at this now than I was when we first started trying it uh, sort of seven or eight years ago. So it does teach you a lot about your own aeroplane and you rapidly become, um, you know, probably the person who knows your airplane best, you know, even regardless of the um, licensed engineers. So so it it, um, it helps a lot to familiarity um, and a tried and trusted trusted scheme. And um, it makes a big difference really um, in terms of the sort of learning process over the various trips and streamlining it and making sure that you have the right tools available to you in the right place and uh, you have the right tooling and the right jigs for the aircraft and um, if it all works then um, it can be a relatively painless uh, process. Some of the very latest um, uh, composite aerobatic planes like the, the, the extra NG is, 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 is now a composite based um, airframe as is the, the game bird. They, they will ship sort of rather quicker than, uh, than our um, um, current extras but even so we can still uh, reduce that sort of time down to you know a day and a half and then a test flight perhaps on, on, on that late on that afternoon so and then maybe disassemble them in a, in a full day so it's not too bad. Okay. And so what level of spares do you take with you? Well I mean we try and predict you know what month all we might need of the main the main kind of items that uh, that might fail so you know there's an, anything to do with brakes and tires anything to do with with um, you know magnetos and things like this we have spares for and starter motors and things like this so obviously um, and, and the other thing is that um, our engineers are extremely resourceful. We have a number of licensed engineers who are, are good at make do and mend and uh, have been able to um, come up with solutions if we've had um, occasional bits of, of damage or rectification, re rectification has been needed. And uh, our support team in China is obviously is, is always good at finding um, finding bits um, if, if needed. But, but generally <laughs> you have to be pretty well, pretty self-supporting. 
Okay. Um, uh, a bit more of a, a thoughtful question here. Um, the CAA recently uh, produced a document on the risk of cognitive impairment due to G-forces. Do you have any comments on that? <laughs> yeah, so um, they, as I understand it, they concluded that low levels of, uh, relatively low levels of uh, G-forces were not uh, shown to be a significant contributory factor to cognitive impairment. Obviously, if you fly to very high G levels and you keep the G held on for um, a long period in a high performance aircraft, then you do start greying out. And if you hold the G on long enough, you will black out. And um, clearly that is a major danger. And it's something that you have to train yourself for and you get used to in these um, high performance aerobatic planes then they don't have the level of the, the duration of the um, G that um, a jet fighter would do. Because if you hold on that level of G for that long, then you do bleed energy very fast and you will lose airspeed. So typically it's a short duration, very hard pull. You can you can you can pull pull, pull out at the bottom of a, a vertical downline at, at sort of nine G, but it will be for quite a short duration. And um, obviously the difference between the, the fast jets and the type of displays that we're flying is that we're also um, under a lot of negative G quite often as well. And uh, negative G is quite horrible. And uh, obviously the blood is, is rushing to your head and it's an uncomfortable sensation. And if you overdo the negative, you can burst blood vessels in your eyes, which um, you know, can be very painful and look rather freaky down at the local disco as well. So <laughs> you've got you've got to uh, you've got to watch for that. And um, if you push negative and then pull hard positive, that's a really good way of um, going to sleep as well, because um, the you know suddenly the brain is going from an overload of blood to to none. And um, so you just have to be careful and construct your sequence and make sure that you don't overdo it. Okay, but generally speaking, you. generally speaking, you do get some warning. It, it doesn't, the lights don't suddenly go off. You know that you're on the edge and when you get used to it, you get a little bit of blurring and you know that you're kind of on the limit and you can stay pretty much on that limit and just back off. Okay, much simpler question this. How many hours do you train a year? Well, um, not, you know, as much as we possibly can, but it's always difficult um, as a civilian display team. What we like to be able to do um, is we have um, a number of winter air shows, usually in normal years. Obviously, you know, since the pandemic, nothing is normal. But generally what would happen is that we have um, springtime and winter displays in places like India and the Middle East. And um, what would tend to happen is that we go out uh, maybe even a week early for those shows and we're able to get several days of good training in over the winter before the display season, using those as a good way of getting current. So and then, uh, you know, obviously it's difficult. We try and try and train, you know, the opportunities can be a little bit limited. So in, in the UK, but I mean, there are minimum levels of currency that you need to make sure that you have. And uh, we're obviously not starting from um, zero. We're kind of um, going with a, a, a tried and tested um, display and personnel from the previous season. But there is a definite work up period required at every spring before the display season. So in a typical year, so let's ignore uh, last year and potentially this year, how many displays do you do a year? Well, at sort of the maximum to tops would be um, about between 50 and 70, something like that. Um, that's not necessarily, um, I'm not saying that that is necessarily individual events, but it is display days. Um, you know, at, at some of the bigger events. 
and uh, so you know it can be it can be time consuming but um, it's it's um, it's getting harder obviously the events of, of Shoreham and all the knock on consequences of that have knocked out a number of the displays which are no longer viable or they don't have locations which are suitable for display flying and uh, you know financial considerations and then of course this latest um, those latest shenanigans so you know we are generally seeing a decline in the number of shows but um, uh, the global stars in particular are doing a lot of overseas shows so if you haven't seen us in the UK we, we it's kind of partly because we are overseas quite a lot. Okay so that leads into another question then so which is your most exciting international uh, show you've done? <laughs> I mean, there have been there have been several really, really, really memorable ones. I mean, I think um, I mean, possibly for me, the very first time that we were flying in very close formation with the big jet was spectacular. Um, you know, the uh, it was a case of um, from where I was sat, you had to look almost straight in front of you to see the nose and way over behind your shoulder to see the tail. And uh, you know, in turns, the the, the wingtip is is just moving a huge amount, even with um, gentle control inputs from the uh, seven five seven six pilot. Um, so uh, formating on that was was incredible. But it's it's amazing in display flying, you you and in in aerobatics in general, it's amazing kind of what you get used to, kind of quite uh, quite rapidly. So by the time we'd done this sort of several times, it seemed in you know fairly fairly natural uh, natural <laughs> thing to be doing. Fair enough. Uh, what additional safety equipment do you use? I think one of our uh, uh, I was going to say viewers, I guess that's what we should call ourselves, uh, spotted that you had a parachute on in some of the pictures. That's it. So, so um, we're typically uh, wearing a, uh, you know, an emergency parachute and uh, there have been instances of colleagues who have used it to good effect. Um, it, it tends to be for, it would tend to be for situations where you had a mid-air collision, something really um, major a structural a structural failure of your your aircraft an engine or a propeller departing or something like that that made it completely unflyable um, otherwise any any other type of um, engine failure or something like that you would you would you would generally try to to fly the aircraft down so um, emergency parachute obviously that you know display flying is 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 tricky because you're always at such low altitude so you don't have much time to deploy it um, then, of course, for the overwater events, an uh, increasing number of events are um, seaside and overwater. So you, you certainly need to make sure that you're wearing life jacket and uh, you might have an emergency oxygen bottle to be able to, um, to, to breathe if you um, hit the water and uh, capsize um, because you tend to get flipped over as the, as the aircraft hits. Um, and um, you know helmets um, sometimes for the heavy duty aerobatic displays with high g-forces a helmet is quite uncomfortable to wear because the the extra weight on your neck gives you even more uh, strain but um, it's generally for formation displays it's um, it's a safer option to to wear a helmet so so obviously they're the key ones Okay. Have you ever experienced any malfunctions in your uh, aerobatic flights? Yes. Um, so uh, generally speaking, you know, if the thing is that if you do this, if you do this type of game for long enough, you're bound to encounter problems really of some some description or other. And uh, we had we had a few with the with a twister with various um, engine failures and uh, so that's always <laughs> always really nerve wracking and depending upon you know how high you are and where you are um, um, in the in, in the display it's a more or less um, you know dangerous situation. Uh, haven't had any 
haven't had any major failures in the extra, thankfully. Um, Obviously, weather is a constant, constant worry to a display pilot as well as, um, you know, aircraft malfunctions. So you can very often the transits to the display sites are as exciting or more exciting than the actual display if you hit bad weather. And so um, that can always be a challenge looking at weather charts, trying to miss weather, trying to dodge through. Uh, gaps in the weather and uh, you know um, um, because the, the the aircraft that we fly are not really very well suited for you know flying in instrument conditions. Yeah okay I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions uh, so apologies if uh, I don't get around to asking all the questions that have been asked but uh, it's getting on. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, a question really that follows on a bit from what we're talking about uh, before, but is human physiology a limit uh, as the hardware uh, on the uh, obviously planes develops? Yeah, uh, I mean, to some extent, yes, it is really. Um, you know, there are there are potentially uh, some figures, certainly on the the negative end of the spectrum, that. Uh, you know, at best would be very uncomfortable and at worst would be seriously dangerous to um, human physiology that the, the aircraft could potentially fly. Um, generally speaking, though, um, for these um, for these uh, aerobatic types, I mean, we have um, 300 or 330 horsepower at our disposal, which is quite a lot, but it's not really so much that um, you know you can easy, quite easily squander it as it, as it were in terms of um, speed and energy uh, when you start to um, put the aircraft through through its paces um, in the in these figures you do run out of energy quite quickly so um, even for the higher performance um, displays you, you you need to you still need to manage your energy quite carefully and um, that puts a limit really on the strain at, at which you're under so there's a kind of a bit of a yo-yo going on you know you're you're under extreme duress for sort of a few seconds and then you kind of get a little bit of a breather and then you're under extreme duress for another few seconds <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how it works okay uh Opportunity to sell yourself a bit here then. Are there any or oh, have you got any uh, air shows planned for 2021 in the UK? Well, it's a sort of, um, you know, we wish um, keeping our fingers crossed um, for what we can do in 2021. Um, Sadly, as, as far as the, the global stars are concerned, you know, it's 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 a slight uh, wait and see situation in terms of what uh, big shows are still going to be running. Um, we are we were supposed to be in China in the spring with the global stars, but that's uh, looking very, very questionable and is probably not uh, not not um, able to happen anymore. And so various shows like that are being pushed back um, in terms of the UK. Um, hopefully um, we'll be at um, the Duxford Spring um, air show if that's able to be held, I believe flying the scale model display there. Um, and um, we are flying with the Global Stars at a Shuttleworth um, Old Warden drive-in air show and uh, hopefully also flying um, uh, myself at uh, the, uh, the display with the radio control model at, at Old Warden again. So we'll be at those those locations and um, also Old Buckingham in, in Norfolk. Um, there are various displays that are going ahead fingers crossed so let's hope that everything the world can be put back together and get back to rights for a, for a decent summer season. Excellent thank you well let's draw a, a line under it there uh, thank you for that uh, Chris that was really uh, interesting and we've had more questions than I think we've ever had before on the um, uh, on these webinars so I think that just shows you how interesting uh, uh, the subject is and uh, 
uh, people have really enjoyed uh, your presentation. Um, what we do for all our um, uh, speakers, normally obviously in person, we present them the uh, our uh, Farnborough Cody Crystal, which is um, uh, oh, right. quite unique. It has the Cody flyer etched in it and we'll make sure we get you uh, your one. Uh, it'll probably go snail's mail. We can't afford air mail. Um, so that'll get uh, posted to you in, in due course. So thank you very much again for that. That was really good. Uh, just a couple of notices uh, you may have seen on the um, uh, slideshow before. We won't be having a webinar in February and February, uh, March is the subject and date has changed. So it's the 24th of March now. It's still a joint uh, webinar with the IET and the IMECI. And the subject will be looking back at the development of the Chevrolet and Trident uh, projects. So hopefully you can join us then. Uh, we will send out details nearer the times with the uh, appropriate links. So thank you all very much for your support. Uh, enjoy, stay safe, and we'll speak to you uh, in a month or so's time. Thank you very much. Thanks.